Hi, welcome to our Centro Church online service. We're so glad that you could join us today, whether it's the first time you've watched or whether you're re-watching because you enjoyed the message. Hey, if this is your first time joining us today, there's a little QR code that's coming up on your screen right now. If you could scan that one, there's a new to Centro section or link that you can click and you can fill out your information and one of our team will get in touch with you. There's also a number of other links that you can click to explore as well. We know that you'll be so blessed by our message today and you'll see us again at the end of the service. So why don't we check out today's message? Morning. How are you all? Are you good? Great. I'm feeling good. Kat and I went away this week with no children and uh, for four nights at Mulaney. There's one of my kids right there. It was good to be away from you for four nights. So, no, no, no. <laughs> he just did this to me. He went like that. <laughs> no, we love you. We do. No, we just love when you're down in Poppy's house. It's good there when you're there. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I can't hear you. Stop talking from the crowd, please. <laughs> no, that's good. No, we had a good time away. And, and uh, man, how was conference last week? Holy moly. Wasn't that just a blast? Far out. You know, uh, talking to uh, Pastor Brett and some of the other team, and you know, it's been a while since we've um, had everyone just laid out on the floor like that. And a uh, huge thank you to Pastor Mark and Dan Hunter as well. They kind of ran the catching team. They were kind of like, I don't know, getting ready for cricket season or something. And uh, can we give it up for those guys? Did an amazing job. It was, like, it was like watching a dance, watching Pastor Mark organize everyone around all the bodies on the floor. It was really, really, really cool. And uh, huge thanks to uh, Jared Ackett and to Caitlin as well, who uh, preached and uh, led our kids, uh, led part of our kids' Unleashed Conference. Big thanks to those. Where's Jared? He, I saw him here this morning. Where is he? Give me a wave. He's not there. Where is he? He's on team somewhere. We're at the back. Where is he though? Oh, there he is waving. We preached at kids church so so good and uh, when you preach at kids the next the next step is on the pulpit here so who wants to see Jared preach here on a Sunday morning there we go come on now he loves it he loves the attention he loves being out in front of people he really enjoys it that's going to be good man what a big couple of weeks we've had though hey you know like we've had our expansion series and we went into prayer and fasting for 21 days then we had our breakthrough offering and then last week we had Encounter Conference, I don't know about you, it was kind of just like, a, looking back, it was like a big whirlwind of things that we were a part of and God doing some amazing things in our life. And I just think before we move forward, maybe we should look back and just remember some things that God did. Is that all right? Can we do that? And so we were, we were, we've been in our expansion series for the last two and a half months, something like that, just talking uh, about areas that, that we really believe God is expanding us as a church in. And so we went into prayer and fasting and that was awesome and we heard some great testimonies from that from people then we went into our breakthrough offering that we do every year in this church in August we take up our breakthrough offering we believe that uh, uh, there's sometimes when we, when we give an offerings that God breaks through we see it in scripture uh, when Elijah gives the offering in Mount Carmel before the offering the nation was away from the Lord then Elijah gives an offering boom there's breakthrough and a whole nation turns to God David gives in an offering and before the offering the nation of Israel was all diseased and sick David gives an offering and boom there's breakthrough of healing right through an offering we believe here that there's breakthroughs that sometimes God seems to move right when we sacrifice and we took up our breakthrough offering and there's a few things that as a church we're believing in for breakthrough um, you know and so we had a we had a plan of what we want to see God break through in in this area and we wanted to uh, uh, um, put fifteen thousand dollars into this building just to keep keep getting it uh, fixed so it doesn't fall. Uh, no, to, to to keep it looking nice. We want to do that. We want to put forty thousand dollars into our building next door um, because there's some there's some things happening next door that tonight at our AGM I'm going to share vision about what's happening next door. So we we, we want to put forty thousand dollars more into there so that lasts another twenty years. That's a great asset for us. Then we want to put $15,000 into our evangelism fund that we have, uh, uh, you know, where we can fund evangelistic things for our church. That's $70,000. Every dollar above that, we're going to start an Ipswich building fund, okay? Because this has been a great home for many, many years, but I really do believe that our, our church is growing, we're expanding, our vision is getting bigger, 
And this might not be in the next 10 years where we meet as a church. Who knows? But we're just going to see what God's going to do. And so we're going to start a building fund. So we started at zero. Uh, The next slide is cash in, right, from uh, a couple of, there there we go. How good is that? So up to $43,000. Okay, so praise God, right? That's where we're at. So we're 61% there. Now, there are people who have said, hey, I'm going to give, just haven't given yet. So the next slide is, uh, there we go. So 45,000, let's just say 500 Christian GST onto that, right? And so there's, there's that much there, right? So we're almost there. Right, so if you haven't given in to this year's breakthrough offering, you still can, right, just by scanning that QR code on the chair in front of you, there's a button that says give, and uh, right there you can put in your breakthrough offering so that, you know, believe God does uh, um, things in your life and things in our church, and so that's where we're at right there. Then last week we had our uh, inaugural uh, Unleashed Conference, how cool was that? Man, that was just unreal, loved, who loved Pastor Daniel's ministry? That was just amazing. And what a great three-day Holy and Spirit intensive uh, that was. I think for some of us, it was a healing moment. Uh, we had uh, Brooklyn, I'm not sure if she's here this morning, but Brooklyn, she, was, she couldn't eat peanuts. Uh, uh, but then she got prayed for, and she went and had a nut bar, and she didn't die. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> she seems to be healed, and she's had peanut butter since then. It's a good day when you can go to the cupboard, put your finger in a jar of peanut butter, and eat it. And it's disgusting, is it? Okay. <laughs> and so we saw that healing. We saw other people uh, came back and told us that they just felt fear and anxiety, like that burden lift off, that they left here feeling lighter, that that kind of thing. We had some, we had a person come and uh, tell us that they were uh, hearing voices at nighttime. Now the voices have stopped, right? So there's been deliverance. So praise God for that. That's good, right? People being set free. So healing moments, that's cool. For some of us, maybe it was a realigning moment. You know, just getting out of old habits and uh, coming to church just to do church, but actually coming to church and receiving something from the Holy Spirit, right? So just realigning ourselves to that. For some of us, it was a teaching moment. I know there's people in our church, both here and at Collingwood Park, who really desire to have that gift of healing on their life. And we need that, right? We need all the gifts functioning in our church, right? If we want to see our church expand, have influence in our city, we need all the gifts in operation here in this church. And I know for some people to watch Pastor Daniel and, and how he ministers in that gift, right? It was a teaching moment, uh, that kind of thing. We had our first ever Kids Unleashed conference. Any kids, in, any kids went there? Well, they're all over there, aren't they? And so, and so any parents have good stories from their kids who went to Kids Unleashed? Just us. Okay, no worries. Cool, cool. And, <laughs> and uh, we heard great stories, right? Our kids learning how to hear the voice of God. That's a good thing, right? Our kids learning how to speak in faith. Our kids learning the power of praise and how uh, praise, uh, uh, there's breakthrough in praise. And so it was a very great teaching moment for us as a church. And so I'm looking forward to Unleashed 2024. What's going to happen? Man, if you weren't here at this conference, holy moly, right? Make sure you register now. Just go see Pastor Mark and just pay now. And just say, hey, I know I can't register now, but I'm just giving you money now. Uh, I'm, I'm getting in first. So it was amazing. And uh, let me say this, though. From the last couple of months, whatever it has been for you, I hope that you have found something in God. Um, I hope that you've found a new level or a new measure of faith, uh, maybe a new measure of healing or a new measure of purpose. I hope that you've, uh, uh, the, the last few months in our church, there's something that has been deposited in your life. Uh, Paul says this, he says this in Philippians, and my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches in Christ Jesus, right? I'm, I'm hoping that there has been some needs in your life that have been met, but I know that sometimes not all the needs are met, but I do believe that God can meet all your needs, right? And there's a process and there's a journey and there's a continuation of the good things that God has done over these last months that God will keep doing. Who wants God to keep doing good things in their life, right? Certainly I do. And so I'm constantly going back to Jesus and saying, Jesus, come on, there's more needs. There's more need in the community. There's more need in my family, right? There's more more need in my church. Lord, I'm gonna come to you all the time because you can meet all of my needs because there's blessings and there's promises and there's breakthroughs that you can claim and they're found in Jesus. But here's the thing, it's one thing to find them It's another thing to keep them. And so what I want to do is over uh, the next couple of months, up until November, 
I want us to kind of walk into a, a new uh, uh, series called Journey. And we're going to journey through some of the key th- areas in life. We're going to look at some, s- some key areas in, in your life um, and, and talk about some particular things. Because here's the thing, right? No one is born into their full potential, right? No one comes out of the womb, you know, dressed in your suit, uh, making the sale, selling the stocks, buying the house, right? You don't come out and, 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 and have all the potential of articulate language, right? No one is born into their full potential, but who knows that there's a journey and it takes a lifetime, right, to get to the end to go, you know what, I finished well, right? And my prayer for you is not that you wouldn't just start well, right? You all started well because you're all alive. That's a good thing, right? But I want you all to finish well, right? I want us all there at the end, right? Uh, when we're with our Lord and going, hey, yes, all the Centro family are here, right? I want you to finish well. And so over the next couple of months, I want to look at all of the detours that we go through in life <laughs> to get to the end that we finish well, okay? And so we're going to look, be looking at things like the promises of God, we're going to be looking at things like marriage. We're going to be looking at things like parenting. Uh, we're going to look at things like pain and loss, right? Because who knows that's inevitable in life, right? How to not live in it, but how to get through it. Uh, creating good habits, identity. Because uh, here's the thing. We live in a microwave culture. We want everything now. We want things now, right? Uh, I, I want what I bought online now. I, I want my way now, right? We live in that thing, but... That's not how life works. Uh, It's never been normal in human history up until this present moment to go to the grocery shop and get whatever you want now. That's never been a normal thing. It's never been normal in all of human history other than now to call someone on the other side of the world and connect instantly, right? It's never been normal to fly for a few hours and get to the other side of the world. That's never been normal in human history. That used to take months, if not sometimes years, right? But we live in this microwave culture where we want everything now, but we're going to talk about actually life is a journey. We don't get everything now. That's just the reality, right? Now is fraudulent. That's not real, but reality is that life is a journey. So we're going to talk about a few things on the road of life. Remember that saying, finders, keepers, losers, weepers, remember that? I don't ever used to say that as a kid, I did, you know, you'd always say that in the car or maybe your sibling dropped something and so you picked it up because you wanted it and they wanted it back and you said, finders, keepers, losers, weepers, and, uh, you know, to justify that what you stole uh, uh, that you could now have, uh, finders, keepers. One day I found something and then lost something. I was about 10 and I remember I was uh, shopping and I was with dad and uh, we were grocery shopping and I found $5 on the floor. And as you, every 10-year-old, that's not the greatest thing that you can find in life, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I don't need purpose or meaning. I just need $5. And so I found $5, and, and I'm like, yes, finders, keepers, losers, weepers, right? Whoever lost that sucked in, it's now mine, right? And, but my dad, it, it's, it's good being grown up in a Christian home. Sometimes it's not so good because they want to teach you things like patience and, and humility and, and, and giving back what's not yours. And so my dad saw me with the $5 and said, hey, is, where'd you find that? And I said, it's on the floor, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. And he said, well, it's not yours, let's go hand it in. I'm like, ah, oh, far out, Christian families. Uh. Anyway, so he went, to the, to, we went to, the, uh, uh, to the checkout person, gave him the $5, told the story, and we went away. Now, between you and me, I don't reckon anyone ever went and got that $5. I don't think anyone went and got I reckon that shopkeeper got $5 richer. Do you think that as well? See, I told you, Dad, right? Everyone else thinks that too. <laughs> now, now, I'm not holding on to a grudge. You know, that I had to give that back. I don't, I, I'd even, I'd, I'd forgotten about that story, really. And, uh, you know, I, I hadn't remembered that. Uh, but remember, back in the day, right, the reason why that $5 was so important that I found it, because back in the day, you could get three lollies for five cents. Remember those days? Right, the bag of lollies, three for five, right? And so I was like, man, th- I, I could, like, this is like dealer level power that I could have in school if I had $5 worth of lollies, right? I don't even know how many, because I've forgotten about that, right? I don't hold a grudge. I don't even know how many lollies you, you get with $5. Yes, I do. It's 300, right? I do remember how many lollies I could have had, right? I could have been a school god almost, right? I would have I held the trade of strawberries and cream lollies in the schoolyard. I would have been just handing out pineapples left, right, and center, right? I would have 
I would have been the kingpin on the underground warhead trade. Remember the warheads that we used to have, right? And the trades that used to happen. Right? I could have owned all of that with that $5, but I lost it. Thanks. <laughs> There's pain when you lose something, isn't there? You know, you find something good, then you lose it. It's terrible. It's a terrible feeling when you lose something that you've, that's good that you found. But especially when life gets more complicated. In life, there's, you know, as you grow up, there's more responsibilities and good, the good things that you find usually come with a greater cost if you lose them. In life, you know, maybe you've found joy and then you lost joy and the complications that come with when you lose joy, uh, maybe things like a loved one, you found someone that you enjoy, and, but then you lose them, maybe an unanswered prayer, you found God, but then the, it says, man, just why are my prayers not being answered? Uh, maybe a friendship, you found a good friend, then you lose a good friendship and the complications that come with that, maybe an encounter with God, maybe you had an encounter with God once before, you were hot, but now you're not, and there's that pain Right, of going, man. You know, I mean, I used to, I used to be able to uh, connect with God in that way, but now I'm not. And, and and you know what? I'm kind of overlosing sometimes. Are you? I'm kind of overlosing sometimes in life. I want to find good things and kind of keep them. Do you want to keep good things as well, man? I want to get the promises that God has for me and the promises of God, and I want to keep them in my life. And so this morning, I want to speak to the thought: finders, keepers. Finders keepers. I want to go through a story of the 12 disciples where they had found something good, then they lost it. But then they did, I want to pull out three uh, thoughts out of this story, three things that they did, uh, that, they, that, that they got it back. What they lost, they got back. And we find the story in John 21, 1 to 10, we see that the disciples, they had found something good, that being Jesus, right? They found Jesus. They had, for three years, they walked with Jesus, they talked with Jesus, they did life with Jesus, they ministered with Jesus, right? They had seen him do all these amazing things and they had participated in all these amazing things. But then the good thing that they found, they lost, right? Because Jesus died, right? And now you and I, and both Jesus, we know and knew that that wasn't the end result, right? Jesus rose again on the third day. Now they didn't know that in the moment, right? And so they thought that they had found this amazing uh, thing, this amazing prize. They found Jesus, the Son of God, and they're here, but then they lose Jesus. I'm going to look at what happens, and sometimes what we do as well, when we think that we are in a moment of loss. And then we're going to look at what happened, what they did to get that joy, to get that good thing back. We find it in John 21, and it says this. It says, later, Jesus appeared again to the, to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, Fellows, or some translations say children, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work. Other translations just say, for he was naked. You know you've had a bad night fishing when you haven't caught anything, have had no bites and you've got no clothes on, okay? That's a bad night fishing. He jumped into the water and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore, about 90 meters. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooked over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish that you've caught, Jesus said. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask that as we unpack your word this morning, that you would inspire us, that you would teach us, Lord, that you would make it relevant for our life. I pray that you would encounter us here uh, just while we come around uh, your word. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen, amen. Now, I'm no fisherman. I think fishing is a thing that you do to learn patience, and I don't want to learn patience, right? <laughs> for me, fishing 
is, is what you do if you want to learn a sport where success is measured by how long you can sit still. <laughs> that's, what, that's what fishing is for me, right? <laughs> but another, put the, that aside, these guys, they knew how to fish. They were professional fishermen. It's what they did before they had actually met Jesus. These guys knew how to fit, uh, knew how to fish. Uh, they knew how to catch fish. But this time, what had worked in the past didn't seem to be working now. Uh, all the things that they knew about the past, all the things, all the old ways that they thought uh, before they had met Jesus, all those things weren't seeming to work in that moment right then. And I wonder, I wonder how many times that we make decisions in life where, you know, it worked last time, but it's not working this time. I wonder how many times we're going maybe back to old habits or old ways of thinking. These guys had fished all night, right? And they didn't change their method. And it led to disappointment. It led to frustration and it led to tiredness. And I wonder how many times you and I are going back to old ways of thinking, right? Old habits, old ways of speaking, old ways of thinking about ourselves and thinking about other people and old ways of getting what you want. And maybe they worked back then, but they're not maybe working right now, right? You know, uh, uh, getting angry, that worked last time. I got what I wanted, but this time it seems to be breaking down relationship, right? And complaining worked last time, but this time it doesn't seem to be working. It's not working now. Sometimes going back to what you know is the very place that you shouldn't go, right? Going back to the past. What does Paul say? He says, I forget, I reject, I turn my back on the past and in the present, I look forward to my glorious hope in the future. That's how we're to live as Christians, right? We don't live in the past doing the old way, the old method, but we live looking forward, right? Doing the new method that we have in Jesus. In fact, what the disciples were doing really in their boat was actually disobedience to God. Because um, when you read the Bible in uh, Matthew, uh, 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 it's in Matthew 28, 16, Jesus tells them before he goes, he says, wait here for my return. He says to wait, to wait on the mountain. And the very next thing that the disciples do is they go fishing. They leave the mountain. They go down to the bottom and they get in a boat. And so they're doing the very opposite that Jesus told them to do. The other thing, you know, that usually we do uh, when, when, when maybe we've lost something, maybe we've lost our joy, maybe we've uh, uh, lost a relationship, right? And, and uh, things aren't going well for us. Uh, things weren't going well for the disciples. And usually what we do, and is certainly what Peter did, was we start making impulsive decisions. And sometimes impulsive decisions aren't good, right? Peter says, you know what? My best friend or, you know, Jesus, he's died, he's dead, life isn't going well, I've lost something good. And he says this, he says, you know what? I'm going fishing. I am going fishing. He makes this impulsive decision. He's not doing what he was supposed to do, right? Uh, uh, he was, I'm gonna go fishing. You know when you're tired, when you're stressed, right? And you make impulsive decisions, right? It leads to a lack of rational decision making. Anyone been there before? I've been there a few times, just ask Catherine, right? <laughs> it leads to risky behavior. It leads to strained relationships, a lack of self-control when we're making decisions impulsively, when we're tired and when we're stressed. Impulsive actions during times of stress and disappointment can have detrimental, detrimental consequences. It's why when you're going through a low in life, don't make big decisions, right? Make small decisions to get through and then assess the situation right? That's how you get through pain and trouble. Uh, usually impulsive behavior is a fruit of selfishness because it's an action based out of emotional manipulation to get what you want now. And we see Peter doing this, right? You know what? I've lost something. I need, I need to fill myself up somehow. So I'm going to go back to what I knew and I'm going to do that now, right? Peter's lost something good. And so I'm going fishing, I'm gonna do what I want to do. Not what is right, but what is me. I wanna go back to what I 
what Ephesians 4 says, that we are corrupted by evil desire, meaning that whenever we come back to me, whenever it's me, myself, and I, usually it's the very easiest place to fall into corruption, right? Where we start making choices that aren't the best choices that we should be making. When you decide out of I, you're deciding out of really a corrupt spirit because anything I is selfish, right? But we live in an I generation, don't we? You know, we have the iPhone, selfish, you know, selfish. Whereas I, I have a Samsung, you know, the Bible says, the Bible says that Samuel sung unto the Lord, right? You know, and so if you have a Samsung here this morning, it's a, you're a person of praise and breakthrough. Whereas the iPhone, you know, listen, we're going to have an altar call later on for all the Apple users here this morning. <laughs> Keep preaching, pastor, someone just said. <laughs> Listen, whether you found something good or you've lost, don't go back to what was, right? When you find something good in Jesus, and I'm hoping that in the last couple of months, you've found something good in Jesus, that you've found breakthrough, you've found a healing, right? You've found purpose, you've found whatever it is, right? Don't go back to what was. Find hope and keep it. So the question is then, how do you do that, right? How do you keep what God has given. Who wants to know that? I want to know that, right? And it's interesting in this story. The story, we can pick out uh, at least three. There's more, and, uh, but we're just going to talk about three, three things that happen in this story that I believe, uh, uh, maybe you found something good, maybe you've lost something, but Jesus wants to give you good things all the time. So how do we stay in that flow of the promises of God? Uh, number one, we see here is number one, we need to obey the word. Right? There needs to be an obedience to the word of God. There needs to be an obedience to when Jesus speaks. There needs to be an obedience when God speaks. We see in John 21 in this story, it says that at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach. But the disciples couldn't see who he was. So he called out, fellows. Other translations say, children, have you caught any fish? Why does he use children? Well, because... Maybe kids are usually always doing what they shouldn't be doing and are impulsive, maybe, right? <laughs> Anyone? No? Just ours. Okay, cool. It's all good. <laughs> no, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it, right? There is, there is a blessing and there is a power attached to obedience to God's word, right? Jesus tells his disciples, stop living in the old ways of thinking and start living in the new way that I've been teaching you, right? Follow obedience, follow my voice. Here's the thing though. Can you imagine for, the, for this moment, right? These are professional fishermen. They've done this their whole life, um, they fished in a certain way. They would bring two boats together. They would uh, put a net uh, around both boats. They would trap the fish and then they would use cast nets into where they trap fish. They, that's, that's how they caught fish. And it was always on the left hand. It, it was on the left hand side of the boat, right? Where they would be casting their net to catch the fish, right? They did this the whole life. And now they've got some person that they don't know who it is on the side of, on, on, the, on the seaside, at the beach, telling them how to do their job. Who knows, that would be a bit frustrating or a bit annoying or a bit, maybe a bit insulting, right? Having someone come to your place of work telling you what to do, you know? Uh, maybe someone coming to your classroom if you're a teacher and, you know, we'll, we'll all go there once the school's back on and we'll just tell you how to teach, how to do your job. Who wants that? No, no one wants that, right? Or maybe in your cab or you're driving a train or a truck, you know, telling you how to do your job, right? We don't know how to do that, but we're gonna tell you anyway, you know? You'd be a bit insulted, wouldn't you? You know, if someone came to your place of work and was telling you how to do your job that you've done for a long time, Jesus is here saying, hey, cast on the other side, telling these guys, hey, you're doing it wrong. They'd get a bit insulted, wouldn't they? And, uh, but you and I both know that this isn't some random bystander. This is Jesus, and uh, Jesus is about to do something great. And we can see right here what happens when you follow the words of Jesus, right? When you follow the words of, uh, of, of, of God, what happens. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes Jesus' words don't make sense. It certainly didn't make sense for the disciples to throw on the right-hand side because that's not where they corralled the fish, right? Uh, the Bible says, give and it will be given to you. That doesn't make sense. 
our culture says give and now you've lost <laughs> or, or at least give and you have less doesn't make sense when Jesus says given it will be given uh, the Bible uh, says uh, uh, you know don't tell people about your generosity our world doesn't say that our world says if you give something plaster it everywhere on your socials so everyone can see all the good things that you've done right and Jesus says you know what do good things and don't tell anyone right he tells us to do the opposite almost Jesus says love your enemies Whoa, right? Doesn't make sense. Sometimes the words of Jesus don't make sense, right? Sometimes following the word doesn't make sense. And because we see the disciples here, the disciples are casting out of habit. They are casting out of what they know. They are casting out of what they've done in the past. They're casting out of, I've cast here before, but all they're catching is nothing. They're getting nothing until they're obedient to the word of Jesus. And I wonder how many of us are also casting out of habit. Oh, but Pastor Tim, I've said those things about myself my whole life. You know, I wonder how many of us are casting out of habit. Uh, but that's, that's how dad treated mum. And so I'm just gonna treat mum that same way, right? It's just what we've been brought up in. Uh, but I always go back to that song when I'm upset. I always go back to that website when I'm low. I always uh, go back to gossip when I wanna feel good about myself. And we're, I wonder how many of us are casting constantly in these old ways of thinking when Jesus is calling us to a new way of thinking, right? He calls the disciples and say, hey, cast on the right hand side. Here's the thing. The fish, I think, were always there. I don't think that they were miracle fish. I think the fish were always there. I think God orchestrated the fish to be on the right hand side of the boat. That's what I think, right? The fish were always there ready to be caught. The good consequences, the good things in life for the disciples, they were feeling frustrated, right? They were tired. Uh, they would have been angry. They would have been uh, 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 annoyed. They hadn't caught anything. And all the fish were there all the time. They were, just at, they were just on the end of obedience to God's word. That's where the fish were. The only thing missing was a new way of thinking. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? So often, right, we need a new way of thinking and stop thinking about how I used to do things, what I, the way that I used to speak, the way that I used to treat people in my home, right? You get, stop casting in that and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Follow God's word and start casting in a new way of thinking. You know, some of Jesus' commands are things like love God, what does that look like in your life to love God? Love others. What does that look like to love others? Forgive, serve, repent, share the good news, be humble. These are all the commands of Jesus, right? There's, there's a correlation between obedience and finding God's promises. There's a correlation between obedience to God's word and walking in the good things that he has for you. Isaiah 119 says, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Man, I don't know about you, but I want to eat some good things. I want to consume some good things in my life. How do you do that? Be willing and be obedient to God's word. Amen? Number two is this. Surround yourself with people who can see. Right? If you want to find good things and then keep good things, surround yourself with people who, you, uh, who can see. John 21, 7. Then the disciple that Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, look, it's the Lord. And when Peter heard this, he put on his tunic and he jumped into the water and he headed to shore. You know, there's been a few times where maybe uh, I've been driving or maybe Kat's been driving and we've been, uh, either of us has been on the passenger seat of the car and we've gone to merge lanes. Maybe I've gone to merge in a lane and Kat said, stop, no, right? Not that she didn't want me to merge, but that she could see something that was in my blind spot. And she said, hey, don't do that. You're about to cause a catastrophe. Something bad's about to happen. Don't merge like that. Don't do that, right? There's power uh, when you have somebody with you who can see things that you can't see. Yeah, right? Peter heard the word, but he didn't know who it was from. And it wasn't until someone else who was in the boat that said, hey, Pete, I think that's actually Jesus. That's actually Jesus telling you 
to cast on the other side. That's actually Jesus telling you to think different, to, to do something different. First Thessalonians says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you're doing, right? The, the, the Christian thing, the Jesus thing is to have people in our boat encouraging each other, right? Calling each other out sometimes, right? The Bible says uh, better is the stripe of a friend than the kiss of the enemy, right? It's sometimes good to have someone in your boat and say, hey, don't do that, that's stupid, you know? Don't do that, you'll lose there. You know, don't do that, that will lead to calamity. Uh, there was a study done um, uh, in, in the States by the influence that those around you have on you. And uh, it showed that if you live with someone who smokes, you're 61% more likely to smoke. Uh, they found um, that, uh, that 20, if you have someone in your life who's happy, you're 25% more likely to be happy yourself. Meaning that one quarter of your happiness comes from somebody else. Do you have someone happy in your life? <laughs> Do you have someone in your life that can make you smile? Right, because one quarter of your happiness comes from other people. Let me ask you this. Do you have someone that prays with you or prays for you? Do you have someone walking your Christian faith with you? Do you have someone who's walking that journey with you who can uh, call you out on or spiritual growth or keep you accountable or pray and support, you know, when you're going through times of trouble, who can serve, you know, when you're going through times of trouble? And this is why in our church, connect groups are important. Who's, who's, who's in a connect group? Give me a wave if you're in a connect group. Come on, right? This is why connect groups are important in our church. Come on, the people in, yeah, I see, I see the coffee cart team waving. That's good, right? This is why connect groups are important because this is where we get people in our boat. It's the easiest way to get people in your boat, in your proverbial car, right? To have people say, hey, come on, let's do this journey together. Let's do this life together. Hebrews 10 says, let us consider how we may spur each other on toward love and good deeds. How do we do that? We get people in our boats. Cool? Number three is this. Sometimes the miracle ends with Jesus, but actually begins with you. Some promises from God require you to act. Yes, Jesus ends up feeding hungry fishermen. And yes, it's probably with miracle fish, a miracle bread, right? But check this out. Jesus also tells them to bring to him what they've caught. John 21 says, the others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to shore for they were only about a hundred yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooked over charcoal fire and some bread. Then Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. I wanna ask you today, what things in life have you caught? Right? What things in life is on your hook? What things in life have, have you caught in life? I want to tell you that Jesus gives freely. Jesus is good, right? He brings miracles, right? But here's the thing. The disciples didn't have to do a thing for breakfast, but Jesus asked them, hey, all those things that you caught, bring them as well. I want to suggest this morning that what that catch represented was this. All night they were frustrated. All night they would have been annoyed. All night they would have been stressed. This is income for them, right? That would have caused anxiety. And all night they're feeling this pain. All night they're feeling this loss. They've just lost Jesus. He was good. Now we've lost Him. We're back here. We know we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be fishing. We should be up there on the mountain. But we're coming back here and we're so frustrated. And then Jesus says, hey, just obey, cast on the other side. They cast, they catch this fish. You can, you can imagine the, the stress just being alleviated off their life. <laughs> you know, man, we've got, we've got what we came for. And Jesus says, hey, bring, bring that weight to me. You can imagine as they're pulling in all the fish, all the weight that that fish represented, all night out in the boat. It represented the, the weight of frustration, the weight of anxiety, the weight of, man, we lost. Jesus says, hey, bring that all here. Listen, I'm gonna cook you breakfast. There's good things for you. But all that stuff there, bring it to me. Bring it to me. And I wanna ask you this morning. I don't know, we've just had an amazing time at conference and 
hopefully a lot of us have you know, brought that stuff to Jesus, but maybe you're here today and I wanna say this, Jesus has a plan for your life. He says that his yoke is light, it's not burdensome. But here's the thing, we need to get that burden and give it to him. We need to get that weight off. We need to bring all those things in our mind, in our heart, the circumstance, the worry. We need to bring all that and haul it in and say, here, Jesus, here, I'm done. You fight for that, I'm having breakfast. <laughs> all right. I'm gonna have the good things that you have for me. You deal with that weight. I wanna tell you that Jesus is a master at that. He is a master at taking the heaviness of life. I don't know about you, but sometimes life is so fast. It's like, man, I don't know even where I am. It's just so fast and there's that heaviness. Jesus wants to take all of that, right? And cause us to live in a life of, of uh, uh, blessing, right? Going through storms and not having to worry because I've got Jesus in my boat. Let's just close our eyes right now. If that's you here today and you're saying, you know what, Tim, uh, there are some things that I need to give to Jesus. There are some things that there is a miracle that I wanna see in my life. Maybe there's a weight of a bad health diagnosis and we believe in healing in this church. Bring that to Jesus. Maybe there's a weight of anxiety, right? Bring that to Jesus. He wants to free your mind. Maybe there's a weight uh, of disappointment. You know, maybe you didn't get what you were praying for and there's disappointment. He wants us to bring all those things to Him, those weighty things to Him. And He wants to feed you. He wants to fill you up. He wants to fill you with His Spirit and take all of that heaviness. So if that's you here today and you're saying, you know what, Tim, can you pray for me? I wanna give all that stuff to Jesus. If that's you, can you just give me a wave just where you are? Awesome. Okay, hands everywhere, okay. Yes. Okay, we're gonna pray just in a moment. In a moment, we're gonna stand, we're gonna worship. And we have our team out here. Um, and what I want to do is I want you to come out just, just in a moment. But if you're here as well and, you're, and you've never said yes to Jesus, and you're like, you know what? I just wanna have breakfast. I, I just wanna meet this Jesus. I wanna meet this person that's gonna give me uh, a, a hope and a future. If that's you here today, and you're saying, you know what? I wanna say yes to Jesus. If that's you, can you just give me a quick wave right where you are? And I wanna pray with you and for you. Anyone here today saying, Tim, I wanna say yes to Jesus today. Anyone here? Maybe you're watching online and you're saying, you know what? I wanna say yes to Jesus. Uh, you can email us, uh, go to our website. One of our, uh, our pastoral team will uh, contact you as, uh, as, as soon as they get that message. Let's stand this morning. Let's stand, we're gonna worship. And if you're saying, you know what? There's some things that I just need to lay at the feet of Jesus. Again, right now, maybe for the first time, first time in a long time, maybe you did this last weekend. It's like, you know what? I've picked up some more disappointment. I've cast and I've picked up some money to bring that to Jesus. So that's you here this morning. As we worship, there was many hands up, right? And so come out in the front. We're gonna have our team pray with you and just believe for the Holy Spirit to fill you up in Jesus' name. We're glad that you could join us for our Centro Church online service. If you did want to connect with us, don't forget to scan the QR code and fill out your details. Also, if there was something in the message that stood out to you and you'd like to say yes to Jesus, then scan that QR code, click the Say Yes to Jesus link, and one of our pastoral team will get in contact with you this week. We hope and pray that you'll join us at one of our live services next week, either at 5 Pring Street, Ipswich at 9 a.m. or 5 p.m., or at our Collingwood Park location at Woodlink State School at 10 a.m. Blessings from our senior pastors, Pastor Tim and Pastor Catherine Spark, and all of the team here at Centro. Have a blessed day.